Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, art and corona, digital art and the masters of art. We'll discuss what future museums will look like in the wake of COVID-19. Then, art lovers in Dubai escape from the lockdown blues with a digital exhibition. And some old stars of European art are at a new show in Moscow. The COVID-19 crisis has forced museums to rethink their designs. But how much change are we talking about? Museums had to quickly change everything, from how they welcome visitors to the way they use space. But these were mainly just short-term precautions. As for its long-term impact, experts predict wider galleries with an option to divide them when needed. They also foresee a stronger connection to the outdoors. The big question, though, is how will museums pay for all of this? Let's go to the founder of Haley Sharp Design, Bill Haley. Hi, Bill. So, I really want to Hello. talk about COVID-19, obviously, and museums and major art institutions. But I think in order to fully grasp the situation, we have to kind of go back and understand what was happening with museums uh, in the past five or ten years, because they were going through transformative times, weren't they? Yeah, very much so. Um, I've been in museums and heritage projects for um, 50 years, and there's been more change in the last five than there have been in the previous 50. And what COVID has done is just accentuate and accelerate the changes that are going to have to happen and are starting to starting to happen. Okay, so what what was the biggest change that was taking place before COVID-19 that has been exaggerated uh, with COVID-19? Flexibility to change and telling... There's two parts of this. There's a physical aspect, which is COVID's focused on, but also an intellectual one about um, diversity and, and changing audiences and what people expect, how we deal with colonialism and all those issues. Um, Black Lives Matters, all these things have all come together at, uh, at this time of COVID. And I think that's going to really accelerate um, how we work in museums and art galleries in the future. Okay. So, uh, for example, I think um, before COVID-19, I have a feeling, I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong, but museums and especially major art institutions had this sort of idea that, you know, if we build it, you audiences, you're just going to come and see it. You will have to do it anyway. So we don't have to welcome you, really. So that was the kind of understanding. But is this what's changing and what has to change with COVID-19 now that the international audience can't really fly uh, to different countries around the world every day? So you have to really welcome your audience, right? That's true. And you need to welcome your local audience and your regional audiences rather than the bigger, broader international audiences um, and that means that the stories you've got to tell have to engage these different audiences and how how you do that um, you can't just sort of say here's the empirical way this is history this is history as we know it so sort of learn it and understand it it's not like that anymore there's just too many perspectives on the same history mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a wonderful opportunity to do and i think technology which was the thing that was physically changing before, as it as can accelerate that because we can do virtual um, reality and all sorts of different sort mm -hmm. of realities. Um, okay, which Bill. Help the You're at a good point. I like it because I think this really reflects on the physical aspect of museums, and I think this Absolutely. is uh, what explains uh, the need for change at the moment. So, tell me, what are we going to see differently? in the physical aspect of museums? Well, I think there's a lot of architects are looking at, you know, they call it the, the race for space. Um, if COVID stays as it is, or we hopefully get it under control in the near future, then I think space is important and how you progress through spaces and galleries. Um, but also then all the things we've been pushing for the last 20 years about making things accessible and touchable and um, feel things, touch things, you can't do, you're not going to be able to do that so much. So technology will allow us to use 
uh, facial recognition, gesture recognition. I mean, I'm using my hands all the time. And I think we'll be doing that in front of screens and lighting systems and sound systems and get a different message depending on um, your age, background, gender. Mm -hmm. um, the, the technology is allowing us to be much, much more um, responsive to the visitor. And Bill, I think uh, one aspect of it is really letting the outside in uh, yes. to the museums, right, in terms of uh, architecture. Why is that the case? I think it just widens the appeal. It widens... You're changing the perspective. You're asking the questions of the visitors. So that why are you looking at things that are, should be inside on, on the outside? So you're, you're asking quite clever questions and making the visitors see things differently. And I think you just got more space. Um, I was su suggesting earlier that um, historic um, houses and buildings um, are, some of them are creating spa internal spaces externally because they have more space there. And so you can imagine yourself in a space um, that changes and develops and has different stories to tell. It allows you a lot more flexibility. If you've got a historic building, it's difficult to change what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, where external space using, I call them ghost structures, which are, they give the size and shape and feel of a space with one or two pieces of furniture, perhaps, um, but not um, try and sort of tell the whole story of what that space and the building was. Yeah. It also means that you're changing the way the visitor sees what they're going into. If they don't go into the building, you you prepare them for um, the past and putting context together because context is the hardest thing about um, historic or um, cultural institutions. Definitely. So, uh, look, Bill, I mean, I, the big question for me here is that we are speculating about all these changes, but then how yeah. much of it are we going to see in the museums? I mean, how much of a change are we talking about? Are we going to see a completely different museums fair after this, or is it just maybe even sort of wishful thinking? Well, some of it's probably going to be wishful thinking, but I think it's, ex I go back to what I said at the beginning, I think they're accelerating the change and they're accelerating. I think the biggest change is going to be how multiple perspectives on the same object or artifact or period of history or natural experience. So it's not just, you know, one person's or one age group or one culture's view, you know, we do a lot of work in the US and you, you have African-Americans, First Nation and um, Europeans all coming together and they all they all have the same history, but they, but they have different reactions to that history. And I think that's where um, the new technologies and the way we're moving forward will happen. And that doesn't always mean lots of new technology. It just means that you can put things in front of people and not let them make their own minds up about it. You you, you ask questions of the audiences today mm. rather than give them, give them the answers all the time. Yeah, and it will definitely be a challenge for museums, uh, you know, oh, yeah. definitely, especially with the financial squeeze that is taking place at the moment. Yep. But unfortunately, yep. this is all the time we have. Bill, thank you so much for, for your time and it was lovely having you. The world is going through an emotionally difficult time and the art world is trying to find some colourful solutions like this exhibition in Dubai where the organisers wish to give visitors a peace of mind. Nursena has more. Dubai's Theatre of Digital Art presents a multimedia exhibition displaying works from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The walls and the ceilings are adorned with animated projections of Monet, Van Gogh and Cezanne, among many other big names of the modern art world. The venue is following the COVID-19 guidelines and is being sanitized every two hours. The way the paintings are shown on all the walls, ceilings and the ground gives you a peace of mind. It puts you at ease. Personally, I think people can relax from the inside and forget the pressures of work, coronavirus and everything else. 
the classical music playing in the background and colourful masterpieces at every corner, the exhibition offers an escape from the reality. And if that's not enough escapism, you can put on a virtual reality headset and immerse yourself in the artworks completely. To be honest, at first I was very hesitant whether to come or not. But the thing that pushed me out of the house is my state of mind and how I have been feeling. I thought that I shouldn't stay confined. As they say, you only live once. So I thought I should go out and enjoy myself, no matter what but while taking the necessary precautions and preventative measures to be safe. There's also an interactive space for children to project their own drawings in the exhibition walls. From Monet to Kandinsky, revolutionary art exhibition has already toured many other cities, drawing over a million visitors. And its Dubai stop will run until the end of December. Last April, the Pushkin State Museum of Fine Arts had to close a massive show covering five centuries of European art. It featured names like Rembrandt, Rubens, Malevich and Chagall. Now they are back. We got a private viewing with the exhibit's curator. Take a look. The Pushkin State Museum of Fine Arts in Moscow has gathered more than 27,000 pieces of its collection, which spans from the late 15th to the mid-20th century. From Dürer to Matisse, highlights the best pieces from various schools such as Italian, French, German, Dutch, Flemish and Russian. Most of the paintings are rarely displayed. The main figure is Albrecht Dürer, the founder of the Northern Renaissance. He was the first to overcome the influence of Gothic tradition over the 15th century German art. Dürer traveled to Italy at the age of 24 and saw Italian art live for the very first time, which inspired him to create Dancing Putti. He studied the plasticity of the human body, which was revolutionary at the transition from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. He was heavily influenced by the heritage of antiquity, a contact so important for Dürer. The Italian school can be characterized by this draft by Paolo Veronese from the 16th century. A representative of the Venice school, Veronese was able to capture volume, light and air. This is an example of a, an initial sketch when an artist's mind just starts to stir. Veronese here used very limited instruments but the sketch still contains the compositional core of the future painting. The 17th century saw the rise of the Flemish and Dutch schools. Among the Flemings, Peter Paul Rubens was the main figure. His drawing, which is called Santor, tormented by Cupid, was made by a 28-year-old Rubens during his trip to Italy. A perfect example of how the Nordic artists mastered the ancient heritage. The drawing shows how the Flemish artist perceived and interpreted antique sculpture. In his drawings, marble comes to life. His characters look almost like living. This image was later used by Rubens in some of his works. Continuing with the 17th century, the main figure of the Dutch school, Rembrandt, used to carry a pen, inkwell and sketchbook with him. This is a very small sketch. A woman holds a child. Collectors are believed to have cut up the images from the sketchbook and sold them separately to make more money. Rembrandt painted with browning, a reed pen which gives such a broader, painterly touch. He grasped the pose of a person with amazing accuracy. The smallest figure in Rembrandt can still be distinguished with extraordinary expressiveness. Moving on to the 19th century, Pierre-Auguste Renoir. This drawing of the girl with hat is considered one of the best by Renoir. It is believed that he depicted his future wife here, Aline Charigo. The draft came at a transitioning period for the painter. The drawing refers to the period when Renoir began to gradually move away from Impressionism. He began to pay more attention to the outlines in the drawing and the smoothness of the lines. He was influenced by Ingres and Italian art. 
and Vincent van Gogh. This is the only graphic artwork by him, the portrait of a young girl. It relates to the painting known as Le Mousme at the National Gallery in Washington. The drawing was made from a painting already finished. Van Gogh sent it in a letter to a friend and artist, Emile Bernard, to show him the just finished painting. There's an inscription on the margins with a description. What object in what colors? And the last stop, the modern masters. The model for this 1945 drawing by Matisse was Lydia Delektorskaya, a Russian immigrant who became Matisse's secretary for 25 years. The drawing was made with charcoal. For Matisse, such sketches were the basis of his work. When he was busy with sketching, he used to dive into the image. The Pushkin State Museum impresses with the scope of the show and offers a comprehensive idea about their graphic collection. It might be a bit overwhelming. And knowing that the show is available only until November doesn't help at all. With his modernist masterpiece, Citizen Kane, Orson Welles shaped the future of Hollywood. For 50 years, the film topped Sight and Sound magazine's prestigious Greatest Films of All Time list. But 35 years after his passing, is Wells still relevant in Hollywood? Ali John has more. You talk about the people as though you own them. Toast, Jedediah, to love on my terms. Orson Welles first breathed fresh air into theaters with his Shakespeare adaptation of Caesar by setting it in Mussolini's Italy. Then he caused a sensation in radio when his play adaptation of The War of the Worlds caused mass panic, with listeners thinking the story of an alien invasion was real. And when he made his Hollywood debut, Orson Welles gave cinema all he got. Due to the success of his previous creative work, the RKO studio provided him a carte blanche deal. That in turn allowed Wells to give his cinematic debut, Citizen Kane, an unconventional visual style. He brought to the mainstream a cinema language that had unique camera work with unsettling angles. Wells was also studying new techniques at the time, and he employed deep focus photography in Citizen Kane. This technique allowed foreground and background mizzen scenes to be both in focus at the same time. Even though Hitchcock used it in his U.S. debut film Rebecca earlier, it was Wells' modernist movie that popularized it in Hollywood. Citizen Kane is a modern American story about a man called Kane. Charles Foster King. The Ernest Hemingway of the cinema. In 2018, an unfinished Orson Welles film from the 1970s was completed. The Other Side of the Wind, a satire of Italian art cinema of the day. It also received acclaim for its groundbreaking style, using a free-moving camera and fast elliptical editing. Movies and friendship, those are mysteries. The film was accepted as proof that Wells had a cutting-edge modern vision even in the later stages of his career. A real movie! I hear you're dying. Ooh, how are you going to last? Today, Wes Anderson's dramedy The Royal Tenenbaums is considered as one of 21st century's most acclaimed movies, both in style and subject matter. The film employs rich compositions and unique camera angles, and even uses the deep focus photography mostly associated with Wells. In interviews, the director of the flick also acknowledged that Wells's family drama, The Magnificent Ambersons, was a major influence. Can't somebody be a jerk their whole life and try to repair the damage? You probably don't even know my middle name. That's a trick question. You don't have one. Helen. Mm. John, this kid's gonna play Lucius. What do you work for nothing? Orson! Quiet, I'm negotiating. Then there is Richard Linklater, a pioneering indie filmmaker who later became an award-winning jaggernaut in the 2010s. He paid tribute to Wells by making a film about him from the perspective of a fan. 
me and Orson Welles tells the story of a 17-year-old teen who first meets Welles and then is cast in his famed adaptation of Caesar. Not more with him, more with him. This is Shakespearean verse for speaking. I know my lines. And I say you need mo time. <laughs> in this quiet neighborhood, on this tranquil street. And finally, we have Steven Spielberg, who's dubbed the king of Hollywood. A mystery is unfolding. He confesses to being hugely inspired by Orson Welles explaining that the way Wells changed his visual style with each movie and how all his films look unique to themselves was a goal he aspired to achieve. What do you want? Anderson, Linklater, and Spielberg. They are considered by fans and critics to be among Hollywood's elite in the 21st century. And the stamp of Wells' influence on their work is proof that his vision is an ever-present presence in the conscious of filmmakers working in Hollywood today. Omelchenko is a gallerist and creator of the Art Patrol video blog, where he talks about contemporary art in an accessible, fun and interesting way. But this is no ordinary YouTube page. Here's his story with his own words. Привет. Hi, my name is Yuri Omelchenko. I'm a gallerist and the author of a project about contemporary art called Art Patrol. In 2015, we opened the Omolchenko Gallery, a huge number of very interesting people from all over Moscow and other cities began to come to us. A huge number of painters, writers, directors, actors. We make exhibitions and catalogs for them, take them abroad, we promote them at auctions. I myself conduct auctions of contemporary art. The peculiarity of the Omolchenko Gallery is that a community has been created here where everyone feels at home. This is a place for friends, for creative people, but this does not interfere with the business in any way. The business of art should be treated as a normal process. Everyone is faced with the same problem, that art is poorly sold. There are also very few art collectors and a huge number of artists. I realized that it needed to change somehow. And in 2017, I came up with the Art Patrol project. The project is needed to expose contemporary art to a majority of the population of Russia, especially young people. They were simply not offered it. Russia is huge. And if you live in some village in Siberia, then you do not have the opportunity to come to a gallery or a museum because they simply are not there. But there is an opportunity to click on YouTube and turn on the Art Patrol and go around the world to Miami, Venice, and the Venetian Biennale. This is the main goal, the popularization of art in Russia. The Omolchenko Gallery and the Art Patrol work in symbiosis. The Art Patrol is a media project. The Omolchenko Gallery is a functioning institution. There are many young artists who have become known because of Art Patrol. I teach not to be afraid of contemporary art. I show that art is not elitist. It is interesting and available. I try to be an intermediary between the viewer and the exhibition and between the viewer and the museum. The main task is that my viewers do not just watch the video, but if possible, take part and come to the exhibition. The Art Patrol has an advantage because a large number of projects are already being created by artists. My task is very often just to catch those projects and show them to the public. Right now, there is a project in the Crimea I flew there to the Tavrida Festival. Right now there is a project in the Crimea. I flew there to the Tavrida Festival. It will be a very interesting episode because there is an art cluster for youth from all over Russia. That place is a real stepping stone for young artists. More than a hundred thousand know about the Art Patrol. 
It tells us that the project is growing and therefore interest in art is growing. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter account have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Neil Perekitli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.